promised a fellow who was a friend that I would do a video scraping up one of his straight edges and I've gone back through a lot of my videos and I haven't actually done a real basic one as an introduction which is what I'll do now what do you need for scraping? Something to scrape, a reference surface, some form of pigment, ink or paint as a medium, something to clean that off with, some means of removing any burrs, dusty brush, a scraper and plenty of these. I will cover each of those in turn. Starting off with the, the bit that you're going to have in your hand most of the time, which is a scraper. They come in all shapes and sizes, and I'll be honest with you, make the one that fits your hand and you like working with, and you can't do that until you've done plenty. For the simple reason, you don't know what length you're going to want, and if you follow everybody else's length, you'll end up finding it bloody uncomfortable. Traditionally, they were made of high carbon steel, and you can pick these up used on eBay. I think that one I paid a fiver for, including postage. <laughs> um, I've just shaped the end of it for getting down into tighter spots underneath dovetails. As things developed, tungsten carbide started being used. And that is literally a piece of tungsten carbide and it's brazed onto, uh, soldered onto a uh, file which I've ground all the a worn file which I've then ground all the teeth off and shoved the handle on the end. When you start going up market you can buy replaceable carbide blades. Um, the only ones I've used are Sandvik and they are that's a 30mm wide blade and from memory it's about 35 quid uh, and if you buy packs of 10 it works out a little bit less. I've never bought a pack of 10. Um, they come in 35, 25 and 20 mil widths and there are other alternatives out there but as I say I've not managed to get hold of any to try them out but what I can tell you is of all the different carbide blanks that I've used from different and different grades the, the Sandvik one seems to hold its edge longest and to be brutally honest when you're doing a lot of scraping you don't want to be at the grinder all the time which is the only bit of kit I haven't showed on here, you want some means of putting a new edge onto your tungsten carbide or your high speed carbide. Now if you're only doing a small area, um, high carbon steel or high speed steel for that matter, gives you a perfectly good edge which will last a reasonable length of time. You've also got the benefit if you can grind it on a standard grinder without any worries. If you're going to be doing a little bit more than a say a single straight edge or the lights I'd strongly recommend you go for a tungsten carbide edge just because it's hard enough learning how to scrape without wrestling with what a blunt blade is um, so I'll cover the sharpening as we're going through um, the next bit inexpensive paintbrush it's got a nice soft bristle and that's for sweeping off your area tuppens ain't me you want a piece of uh, stone which is uh, flat now I have the advantage of I used to do a lot of woodworking and I've got quite a few of these bench stones which were at the time expensive about 15 years ago you can now pick something similar up made in China for I think 10 or 12 dollars and a inexpensive I mean mine's a, a teardrop shape and there are lots out there you want a fine grade Carborundum stone or Indian stone. Use the diamond stone to flat it off, and you want it so that basically you can move it around and it's not got a hump in the middle. I use a marking blue made by a company called Stewart's, which is readily available in the UK and on the internet. I think a tube of that is a, from memory about seven quid. Uh, so not far off of a, what ten dollars and a tube of that will last me quite a few weeks of scraping i think i did the whole lathe with the bed with one not even a full tube um i use mineral spirits which is white spirits to clean that off i apply it now basically with a rolled up cloth 
and that is literally a piece of um, soft cotton cloth, pure cotton, no polyester or anything in it. And you know you see there, it's got a, a wrap of um, copper wire around, twisted down like a tourniquet to make it nice and tight. And no, it's not lint free, and yes, it does drop tiny little bits, but I've yet to come across any other medium application which doesn't drop little tiny bits. As long as you're aware of it, you can work with it. My reference surface is actually a small surface plate, and it's 12 by 8. This one appears to have been surface ground and then a rudimentary flaking over the top of it. Uh, it's got next to no depth, which means you need very little ink on it to fill it. So you're ready to, you're ready to roll pretty quick. Um, why do I use that? Because that's the smallest surface I've got that will still fit that on it. If I was working on a bigger, longer uh, straight edge or a bigger part, I'd use a bigger plate. So you want to try and keep things to the bare minimum, not least because you've got to hump them about all the time. First job before we do anything is make sure that our reference surface is good. We've all got one of these, uh, quite helpful. Don't use uh, any barrier cream on your hands when you're doing scraping because I think you'll find that it, A, it makes your hands soft and B, everything sticks to them so you never end up clean. And you're just going over the plate and you're making sure there's no dings, burrs or anything you can feel. And if there are, you just take them down with your flat stone carefully. Once we've got that down, and take our dubber. This will piss a few people off. So-called experts. Now I've, I used to use a roller and what I found was that the roller after a period of I don't know, 20 or 30 hours of use it was dropping little tiny bits of plastic which are right hard and you've got to clean every one of those little tiny bits of plastic off and because they're so small you could barely barely feel them let alone see them and when it finally fell apart i replaced it and the other one lasted about half as long um they weren't cheap i mean they were 25 quid uh, ink plying rollers uh, my mentor used a piece of cloth as i've showed so i've started using that and uh it takes a little bit longer to get a coat in, but a lot, lot less time picking stuff off. Now, when you first start, and you're prying your ink, you want enough ink on there, basically, to give you a print, but also just to provide a little bit of a film between the part you're trying to print, which isn't perfectly smooth and certainly isn't flat when you start, because it provides a little bit of protection again for this to make sure it doesn't get damaged. Now on a plate where you've got more that's surface undulations or more depth to the scraping on it, you need to apply more ink, which means it does last longer because every time you're moving it over, you're picking it out of the troughs and depositing it on the high points. With a plate that's effectively flat like this, like a and smooth, I'll probably have to reapply ink several times. And you're just basically putting it on to make sure that you've not got any dirty great big lumps all over it. Because the longer you, more wipes you get of it, the more rubbing over of the, the part, that'll progressively even itself out anyway. Once that's done, shift it out of the way. Don't keep it on the desk where you're doing your, on the bench where you're doing your scraping, because you don't want cast iron dust and grit getting onto it so otherwise you've got to clean it all off and re-ink it so mine goes over there uh, word of caution try not to put it the other end of the workshop because it gets a long walk every time you go pay something down to it next job is to have a look at the straight at this straight edge and i'm going to clear the decks now and then we're going to have a good look at my friends straight edges On Instagram, I've been had an account on there for I don't know, maybe two years. Uh, there's a chap on there from the other end of this country, uh, down in down in Essex, called Clive Lamb, and he got fed up with the fact that you couldn't buy a cast uh, or a new cast straight edge in this country. 
So he set about making his patterns and produced a range. And he goes from, this is his, if you like, small sample one, 12 inch. I think he's gone up to 40, no, 72 inches, six foot, something like that. I'll put the details for the contacts. Anyway, he was uh, he, he sent me a few comments on posts I put on, and then we had some dialogue, and he said, oh, I'm going to cast some. Do you want to have a look? So I said, yeah, fine, let's have a look. Um, and he does a range of these in different lengths, and uh, this one's a 12-inch one. I think it's a 45-degree bevel, so pretty much get into anything you, you're going to find. Clive only supplies these machined. That way you can guarantee that the cast iron's got no porosity in it. And uh, the castings, that they come when they come to him, he then sends them out and they get heat treated. So what you should end up with is, is a stable casting. Now this is, as he's delivered to me, so it's had, his, had a coat of primer on it. He's tickled up the, uh, the faces and machined, ready to go. So the next thing you need to do is to basically, you need some means of holding this because we're going to scrape the flat bottom first and then the second face will be that. A normal camel back, you'd have a, a curved top with maybe a couple of pads on. These are a design he's come up with via AutoCAD. So the, the size and the dimensions of the webbing is to optimize the rigidity of that face and give you better uh, resistance against distortion from heat transfer and the likes. Right, so I'm going to set up some kind of uh, setup to hold this flat like that and then we'll um, take a look at the bottom of it. Right, I'm set up for work now, so I'm off my fancy clean cloth. Um, I've got a piece of MDF sat on, it's actually sat on a saw table. Uh, the straight edge is clamped against a vertical wooden face and the clamping is such that it won't move but there's not enough force going through it to actually distort anything. I've seen guys do straight edges where they clamp them in a vise, where they clamp stuff to it and it sits. There's two things you want. One, don't distort it and two, it's got to be quick to set up because you're going to be picking that up and putting it down a couple of dozen times at least as you're going through the scraping cycles. And the last thing you want to be doing is fighting around moving bits left right and center um i usually find that after three or four passes i've got things sorted to how i want them um the other thing you need is you need to be able to scrape from one direction turn around and then scrape from the other direction if you don't you run the risk of basically ending up with effectively a ridge and a furrow all the way down it um, because if you just turn the part round, you're actually scraping in the same direction all the time common fault easy easy to uh, fall into the trap so uh, the first thing we do once we've got it mounted up we're running our hands over it there's bits of over paint here cheers Clive I'm going to put a bit of a uh, mineral spirit on it a bit of mineral spirit spirit onto my uh, diamond stone Clean the bottom of my India stone, and then I'm just deburring it. And the way that that's sucking down, I know that it's a pretty good face. Let me take the first of what will probably be a couple of dozen rags. Clean that off. Run our fingers over it. The end of your scraper, and I'm going to be using this Sandvik tip one. Uh, the scraper I made, you can buy them, I think, from memory, 35 45 quid for a, a unit. Uh, they are a bit long, but uh, you'll get away with it. Uh, end of the end of the scraper's got a curve on it, and people get really excited about what radius it's got to be. Um, yeah. To start off with you're just going to be removing metal you want it as flat as you can otherwise you end up digging troughs with it and it's got a slight bevel on that end so there's a cutting face there and a cutting face there and what you're actually producing is a negative face 
you're not digging into the cast iron you're effectively scraping it over if you look at turning tools for cast iron when they used to use uh, just high speed steel they a negative rake on them so we're going to go over it and give it a single pass i'm just going to do push push scraping to start off with because it's fairly quick and even um if 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 this was a pretty crappy surface i'll be just looking at a roughing pass what i'm actually going to do is do something with about three quarter of an inch stroke <laughs> one pass take your tickly brush sweep your area off and I'm just having a look because I can still see the tooling swirl so I could now do another pass that way basically uh, so instead of me working across it lines like that I turn those through 90 degrees and work across like that I'm not going to, I'm just going to uh, put a bit of uh, oil on it, a mineral spirit on it. Now I can feel the burrs on that now. And there's no, there's no weight there. But you can feel as the burrs get knocked off. I'm just going until I, I stop feeling the, any bite from the stone, which is where it's biting on the... Take your cloth, give it a wipe off. And then run your hand over it. So all we've done there, or started to do, is remove the machining marks. And we undo our clamp. take it over and we do a print but a couple of things to remember when you use the white spirit it runs off the edge and over the part so then when you invert the piece onto this onto your surface plate all that white all that runny stuff runs down onto your surface plate and destroys your print so you've got to be a bit uh, I used a lot then because I knew it was fairly rough surface you want to put the bare minimum on and then uh, it's less to clean off you'll find the first few cycles you'll be picking up bits of fluff and bits of chips and all sorts bits of flakes paint although in fairness to clive these are pretty clean castings I cleaned up some old, uh, sort of 50 year old straight edges and they've still got sanding, sand, sand in the castings. <laughs> we're not hanging on to it for very long so we don't want any heat out of our hands distorting it. And lower it down at one end and then on the other and you're listening. I can hear something under there. And then I'll, when I'm doing a rub I just move it from one end and I'll try and be consistent about which end. And I can tell you now it's not touching very many places. It's going to go diagonally because it just gives me a little bit better area. I'm going to mark the end that he's holding. Yeah. Now, if I'd grabbing it both hands and rubbing it vigorously like that, I could get a lot more ink on that, but it wouldn't be a true rub.
So that's the end on memory that went down first. The opposite end, it's basically touching along that edge. Now this is the bevel edge. There's slightly less weight on that, and we need to bear that in mind as we progress with the scraping. Because if there's like slightly less, less weight on it, it'll pick up slightly less ink. As long as you're aware of it, you can work with it. So, I started out with my scraping going that way, I'm now going that way. I'm not looking at gouging big holes out because I don't think it needs that much off it. It's a little bit less this time. Wipe it off with my hand. I'm feeling for any burrs. Undo my clamp. Wipe off the excess juice. So basically it's rotating about that corner, uh, sorry, that corner and that corner. Is that right? Yeah. And that corresponds with what we've got on the ink, where we've got a pick up there, and a tiny little pick up here, and then there's a couple of blobs. And we just keep going like that. That's had five cycles now, so you can see that the uh, the two corners which were touching here and here, they're slowly spreading across. So this it's just this area is now light. And I'm not leaning on the scraper, I'm only taking off a small amount each time. So the uh, machining was pretty damn good. Uh, the cast iron itself uh, not buttery soft, but it's, uh, it's easy enough to work. Uh, it's certainly a lot softer than I found on my lathe bed or on some of the other straight edges I've done um, which makes it a bit more pleasurable to, to work Right, I'm off to another few cycles and I'll bring you back in a minute That's seven cycles and you can see now that that area which was low here is starting to pick up ink But we've not got an even scrape over it yet You can barely touch this area so we just keep working it around. Um, what I'm actually doing now is picking off the blues because I know there's not a big difference in the, if you like, in the flat plane between these high points and the unprinted ones. There's certainly less than half a thou. That's uh, a 10 roughing cycles. And for all intents and purposes, biggest holes probably there. that's near enough for there um it's pivoting and i'll bring you down in a second but it's pivoting there and there i'll show you why why with a close-up no i don't know whether you should be just be able to work out that the the blue spots there have more of a grey on the inside. Yeah. That's another high one there. And the same at this end. And that basically means that the, the, ink, the ink that was there has been squished even thinner. So what you're actually looking at is the, uh, the cast iron with the, the thinnest of thin veneers on it. Let's try and zoom out a bit. So yeah, uh, 10 cycles, that's roughed in. Now normally what I would do would be then basically take the clamps off and just leave this sitting on top of the surface plate just to make sure that nothing's going to relax, move or otherwise. What I'm going to do is give it another couple of cycles now, just taking off the blues and I'll video it so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, the key thing is once you start getting a reasonable spread, if you remember when I started, I was doing three quarter inch long strokes. I'm now down to 
about three eighths of an inch sometimes down to a quarter as you reduce the length of the strokes the intensity of the, the points per inch starts to increase now at the moment i'm still for all intents and purposes just scrubbing off the blue once these areas disappear and i start getting a much more even it's a bit a bit light on this area when i start getting a more even coverage i'll start spacing the uh, scrapes out and uh, we'll cover that in a minute so i'm just removing the blues and i'm trying to keep the scrapes to sort of three eighths of an inch or less and i'm not rushing but i am i'm not trying to separate scrapes i'm literally just skimming off the tops great pressure on that it's just the weight of my hand uh, I've learnt a long time back if you want to gouge out big holes you lean on it a lot but bear in mind every bit you take off if it's too deep you've got to take everything back down to that level so I came to the conclusion it's much better to take lots of shallow cuts until you've got a flat plane and then texture it it is to start out on the basis of digging through uh, a thou or deeper and taking everything down. It's just a different approach, I guess. It's a damn sight easier taking cuts which are half a thou deep than uh, a thou and a half. A few words about sharpening. Um, as my friend Clive will tell you, folks in the north is generally tight. I'm tighter than most. Uh, tight meaning don't like spending more waste. Certainly don't like wasting money. These things are expensive. Um, the sooner you come up with a method of grinding them that is gives you a consistent result. It could be a bad result as long as it's consistent you can tweak it until you get a good result so the first first thing i did was um used to grind it on a, a green wheel on a standard bench grinder and uh yeah results were all over the shop it might be good one grind and next grinder can't get a take a scraping with it um robin renzetti did a short video uh, on a scraping that he did and he showed using a, a diamond hone wheel i think it was a 600 grit uh, and he modified a uh, relatively inexpensive slow grinder wet grinder so i had looked and found a very similar kind of thing uh it's a pile of crap uh i think it was 28 quid but it does a job just had to take the wet grinding wheel off make up a hub and put on a three pound 50 diamond flat wheel uh, and I actually bought a set of them for I think 20 quid and they go from a 36 grit right the way up to a I think a 400 grit and I use a 600 on it and basically uh, I don't use any jigs for grinding the radius I do it all by hand as you've just seen uh, because I'm not particularly fussed on the exact radius and it's probably a compound radius on mine anyway um, I know that certain guys who teach scraping 
specify a given radius for a given task and that's fine they have a system it works for them brilliant all i can tell you is a large f relatively flat radius is great for leveling things out if you want to use something with a, a, a tighter radius there's not a huge deal of difference between them yeah so with a tighter radius you can produce a narrower width scrape or for the same width you can go deeper i use the the, the other one for uh, getting into dovetails every now and again i will put on a narrow or a tight radius where i'm looking at just increasing the points per inch or splitting up an area which is a bit too solid it sometimes takes a bit of pressure off my arm uh that's about it so if you don't if you do anything on scraping get your sharpening right because it makes life so much easier and as i mentioned earlier i don't believe in heaving on the scraper to get take out a dirty great big gouge because you've got to do a dirty great big gouge all the way across it and you, what you'll find is you're deeper at the start than you are at the end or you're deeper in the middle than you are at either end so when it comes to actually getting an even distribution of contact points um you've got a lot more work to do if you're not if you've not been consistent and you've not produced a consistent face and i think from the people i've spoken to and the people that i've seen scraping or trying to scrape that's the problem the inconsistency of their scrape and yeah practice improves right so i've got a bit more dirt to do on this um still taking down just taking down the blues it's pivoting around here and here so we're still a bit too far out we need to be about there and there um, but it's coming together each pass So now I've got one edge there and one edge there. When those two are blunt, I flip it over so this and turn it around so the sticker's on the bottom. Then I know that I've blunted both ends. Silly little thing, but it saves resharpening a sharp edge. schematical representation of the scraped surface so you've got a high spot here a slightly lower spot slightly lower again and it's, let's call that a medium spot <clears throat> they're going to pick up transfer blue on the tip these aren't but in reality what happens is that little film which is microns thick gets squished down so you get basically a squished area and then a thin veneer so if you were looking at that if you're just looking at that you're gonna get a veneer there and then basically a thicker blue around the outside and that thin veneer there in the extreme looks like dark dark gray almost black they call you some guys call it a bullseye surrounded by the pigment whatever you're using in my case blue but other guys use red so the reason you you, you don't take it all off once you get past a certain number of or certain distribution if i went ahead and took it off to there all i've effectively done is made that point then lower than that one and I end up you just end up chasing the same dots down um which you know will still result in you getting a flat surface it will just take a bit longer whereas if you just nick out the top of it with a shallow scrape that then brings that layer almost in, to that and then the next cycle you're going to take those two down and you'll pick that one up so then you've all, all straight away you've got three points of contact rather than one hard one a slightly less hard 
a medium one and an almost contact. Does that make sense? Um, another question got asked is, do I ever check the depth of my scrapes? Uh, I did when I started, I used to do a lot of running it over with the DTI, with a little finger gauge, and I was looking for anything between half, half a thou and a thou. And the net result of that was, I got my ear clipped by my then mentor, Chris, basically saying, what are you pissing about doing that for? It's not necessary. You only want the deep scrapes for shifting material, once you've got a level plane, your final pass will go over it and put your oil pockets in. Now he's not talking about what's regarded as flaking. Um, the style of scraping that Chris did, and mine's a, a pretty poor imitation of it, he would he would generate a plane which was, for all, all intents and purposes, not far off a ground finish. You might get that, and you'd get that as an area of contact. That is an area of contact, and that is an area of contact. And his his scrape profiles were basically, there were still, let's call them half moons. There were that, that would be the deepest point. The width there would be reduced as that length reduced. So the actual shape of it stayed the same, but he'd end up doing curls that sort of size. So your deepest points were put and then in between, you'd, you'd end up with almost a crisscross of contact points. And then his final pass would be some, something in the approach in between those two. And he'd just do an even coat all the way over it. It looked fabulous. Sadly, I never got the chance to see him finish, uh, put a finished coat on uh, one of my straight edges. He's, he passed away before he could uh, finish one for me. But he did show me some examples. So... Uh, I only make my scrapes as deep as I could be bothered to push a scraper and then the final uh, pass over, once I'm happy I've got an even plane, will be basically to put in oil pockets and they're all around about half a thou deep, but they're spread a bit wider than when I'm doing the contact for bearing. hope that makes a bit of sense. Alright, so we've uh, got a print extending over the full extent. A uh, bit high density over that area and over that area. Hinging's good, which is where you've got the high density areas. So now it's a case of trying to pick out the higher of the highest of the highs and lowering the face down so we pick up more contact points along the, the bevel edge. So I am going to go over it now with a, 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 a much shorter stroke, something in the region of a quarter of an inch and fairly narrow, maybe about an eighth of an inch. And that'll start increasing the points per inch, but also lowering the surface. And I'll just be a little bit lighter on the cut over this front edge. Quick word on a common error, which is basically down to a decision or a choice that you make as you're going along between going from sort of a roughing cycle to finishing cycles. You quite often get it wrong. So if we look at this, you can see the contact areas. If you look at the area to the right hand side, so down here, you've got much, 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 much less contact and yet the rest of it's fine. So I've got two options now. I can either carry on scraping all the little blue bits off and eventually it will bring that into the same density. Or I can go back a step, do two, couple more roughing cycles over this area, taking that down so that then becomes the higher area. It's a lot easier to work that then. Uh, and the, the way that that's happened is I've, I've moved from do it, thinking that I've got reasonable coverage. I actually haven't. I've got some low spots in there. I'm sorry about the reflection of the light, but 
you can see there are contact points but nowhere near as much as they should be and it's important that you recognize that otherwise you can spend an awful lot of time just keep taking these blues down and gradually and gradually you know you'd be talking about half a dozen cycles of just taking the blue off whereas if i do one rough cycle probably three lighter cycles it'll be there what's and all with me Got it fairly even. And what you'd expect after that is um, you're basically going to be left with a lot less uh, contact points, but you should see more in that area. And the reason you'll see less elsewhere is for the simple reason you can't guarantee that every high point you had before has come off so you might have a couple of cycles of just picking out the highest of the highs afterwards i need to re-blue me re-spread me ink around a bit more <laughs> 